Bok Shun Brock the Species specific behavior refers to that behavior which is characteristic of a given species. Behavior which is truly species specific will be found without variation in each individual member of the species for which the behavior is specific. Which is to say, it's got a swim, bird got a fly. I got a love, one man till I die. Can't tell who loving that man of mine. You've been studying species-specific behavior in animals for some time. What are you trying to find out? We try to find the mechanisms by which animals recognize stimuli, and particularly the very simple stimuli which elicit given species' common behavior patterns. You and some of your students are working now with sign stimuli in the ring-billed gull. Why is that? Well, we want to find out why the ring-billed gull has a ring around its bill. And we hope by studying the behavior of the chicks that we can see if this ring is a sign stimulus to make the chicks peck. What are some of your hypotheses? Well, the ring bill gull is an inland gull, unlike most of them which live along the coast. And it feeds, at least to some extent, on insects. And insects are black, and this ring around the bill is about the same size as uh, several black insects. So we feel that it might possibly be related to teaching the young how to feed on insects. How do you determine what stimulus the animal is actually responding to? Well, we use models of various kinds, which are presented to chicks, and the responsiveness of the chicks is recorded as the number of pecks per 30 seconds or some other uh, given time. And then we can see which sorts of stimuli elicit the greatest responsiveness on the part of the chick. Is it generally true that the closer the object looks to the real object, the more the animal will peck? Surprisingly not, but one can often artificially create what's called a supernormal stimulus, one which is better than a natural situation. And so it's possible to give various kinds of birds larger eggs than their own eggs, and they will often take these eggs if they're not too large, in preference to their own. Is there analogous behavior in human beings? Well, we think there are various kinds of supernormal stimuli in humans. For instance, uh, there are um, probably signed stimuli for sex recognition. On Wall Street today, 10,000 financial wizards turned out to greet Francine Godfrey, citizen of Brooklyn, operator of a bank computer, 432537. Each day for weeks, the crowd that's greeted Francine's emergence from the subway has grown. Today's throng was the biggest and the most disappointed. We gave her the day off, reported her abashed employer, and in Brooklyn, Miss Gottfried allowed, I think they're all crazy. What are they doing this for? Francine Gottfried, 43, 25, 37. Why don't you tell us what imprinting is? In the imprinting experience, the young animal, when it first comes out into the world, let's say a duckling, hatches, comes out into the world, it attaches itself to the first larger moving object, which normally, of course, is the female. This is the original formulation, and uh, we started to do something which uh, I think all uh, good psychologists are supposed to do, and that's to make it a science. So this is the paradigm for all imprinting experiments. The eggs are collected. Uh, they are then hatched in incubators. Uh, the young are then isolated in small 
boxes. What's the purpose of that? Uh, so that there is no possibility of forming an attachment, let's say, to their siblings, to the caretaker in, in the laboratory. So they can't see anything? They're not supposed to see anything, and as far as possible, we try also to have auditory isolation. All right, then the animal is taken out of this isolation uh, chamber, is placed uh, usually in a runway, so that it is allowed to follow an imprinting object. In our experiments, we use a male decoy. Its coloring is a representative of the male green-headed mallard. Inside, there's a loudspeaker. And through this uh, loudspeaker, we can play some arbitrary sound. We used a human recording saying, gok, 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 over and over again on an endless tape. Now, this goes on for a matter of, say, 10 minutes. The duckling is then again placed into isolation. And at some subsequent time, it is tested to see whether or not this imprinting experience really took. The testing is done so that the duckling has a choice to go either to the decoy on which it was imprinted or to go to uh, a model of a female mallard, which would be the normal imprinting object. Now, with that, we found out that at 12 to 16 hours, there's a maximal sensitivity is this in any way instinctive imprinting? They definitely have to be genetically organized uh, behavior patterns which allow the young to make these responses. There is no question about the baby having organically determined responses at birth. All learning must necessarily capitalize upon that. This is an example of a conjugate reinforcement procedure in which the infant has uh, a nipple in his mouth which can control the movement of the doll above him. Now right now the infant is sucking on this much as an infant might suck on pacifier, but the baby's behavior is not controlling the movement of the Raggedy Ann doll. But now I'm going to flip on the doll as he comes gradually to appreciate that his own sucking behavior is producing that action of the doll he will probably, if he behaves like most infants in this regard, increase his rate of sucking. What kind of things are you trying to find out in the work you're doing? Well, our research is concentrated on uh, learning processes, uh, mostly. Uh, the newborn child comes into the world with a whole variety of responses which uh, he engages in. Our research program is directed toward the, toward the study of the way in which the infant uses these responses uh, as he copes with his environment. Do you think there's any implications for this kind of research and things you're finding out about the early learning? Well, we, we know that newborn children do learn. It is what happens to them in their environment that has a profound effect upon their later behavior.
Francis went through the trial was Pavlovian conditioning. That is, the rabbit was paired or associated with a loud, unpleasant noise. Right. There's another kind of conditioning which is caused by what happens after somebody does something. If you do something that produces good things, you're more likely to do it again in the future. That's called operant conditioning. And that's a very powerful factor in our everyday lives. Uh, usually when we say we've learned something, that's what's going on. We've done something that's produced some sort of favorable consequence, a reward, we call it a reinforcer. And whenever reinforcers occur, you are much more likely to do that again. How do you know what a reinforcer is? <laughs> a reinforcer is roughly the same thing as reward. Uh, praise is a reinforcer. Money is a reinforcer. Uh, attention is a powerful reinforcer. How do we get to any sort of complicated behavior? A term psychologists use is uh, shaping. Uh, a very common a laboratory example <clears throat> is shaping a rat to press a bar. Well, if you sit and wait for that to happen, you may be waiting a long time. So they use shaping. As soon as the rat looks at the bar, then they give him a drop of water, pellet the food. Then when the rat moves a little closer toward the bar, another reinforcer. Then the rat touches the bar with his paw, another reinforcer. You gradually shape that behavior into what you want, something much more complicated. Finally, he's pressing the bar. Every time he presses the bar, he gets a reinforcer. That's shaking. Where do I stand on the issue of war? You know exactly where I stand. I say, whoop them good. Give them the gun. Well, uh, uh, guns and butter. De-escalation. Beat your swords into plowshares! Peace on Earth! A new age for mankind! Peace, brother! What's the point of studying a reward or reinforcement control in the laboratory? The problem is, we're not always the kinds of people we'd like to be. And I think that's because the rewards and punishers aren't falling in the right places. Going to school is a, is a good example of that. Most kids, when they come to college, really want to be a good student. But somehow, the immediate reinforcers in most colleges are designed so that very few people accomplish what they went to college for. We're talking about an educational revolution. With college students, I think that if they study for an hour, they probably should get reinforcers right away. Uh, some kind of feedback telling them how they're doing for every hour of study. With retarded children, if you're trying to teach them something, you should probably be sure that they're getting reinforcers every few seconds. What's your name? Cha-cha! Good boy, you're Cha-cha. Cha-cha, what's this? Oh. No, it's good boy. That's your no. Cha-cha, what's this? Hi. Hi, good boy, that's your I. Very good. What he's doing in the beginning here is a um, review of the existing repertoire. He's going through it very easily now, but all of these behaviors have been acquired through a training process. The behavior that is currently being trained is that one which involves not only the recognition of the word knows on the doll and on himself, but also we're attempting to set, set the stage for a two-word response of cha-cha's nose and baby's nose. Show me the baby's nose. Show me the baby's nose. Can you show me the baby's nose? 
Good, that's the baby's nose. Good boy. Cha-cha, whose nose is that? Baby's nose. Good boy, that's the baby's nose. Baby. Baby's nose. Very good. Put it in. Who has tokens? Me. Okay. Give me a token. What would you like, Chuck? What? What? Can you say ice cream? Ice cream. Ice cream. Okay. There's some ice cream. Now, you're going to apply this kind of analysis to complex human behavior. There are times where human beings must and do respond to a situation where they've not been trained before. Right. We've been playing this, this sort of thing with pigeons. You can teach pigeons to be creative. You can teach pigeons, in a sense, you can teach pigeons to discriminate between pictures of people and pictures of non-people. You reinforce the response of pecking at a cube that has a picture of a person. You withhold reinforcement when he pecks at a cube that has a picture of an object. You give him this sort of discrimination training with a large number of pictures of people and objects. And before long, he's got the generalized concept. He's creating. Reinforcement is a powerful influence on behavior. <laughs> Is aversive conditioning an effective way of changing behavior? Punishment is probably the most effective method available in conditioning and learning for eliminating behavior. Why is that? When we talk about punishment, what we mean is delivering an aversive event, a painful event, immediately upon the person's making the undesired response. And Immediacy is one of the most powerful variables in almost all aspects of conditioning. Are there any undesirable effects of punishment? When punishment is delivered in a particular situation, then you become apprehensive when you're in, your, in that situation. And if you don't want to have a very apprehensive individual, then you don't want to use punishment. Secondly, if you're punished in a given situation or by a given person, then it generates escape. And that is, if you can possibly avoid that situation, you will. There's another general class of behaviors, however, that most people probably don't know about that result from punishment, and that is the startling fact that punishment, painful events in general, produce a whole instinctive complex reaction. It produces aggression. Okay, here we see two rats, and they're engaging in normal rat-like behavior in a small space. We're going to apply the shock, and we'll see the shock indicator on this flash of light on the bottom. And on that first flash, you can see now they've been transformed. The shock makes them run around and engage in escape behavior. What we can expect is this escape behavior to extinguish when they realize that they can't escape. And then they'll start facing off toward each other, threatening each other. What this kind of reaction shows is that when punishment is delivered, it produces the desire to aggress, to destroy, to lash out at your environment. What are the implications of your work for a society that uses punishment and deprivation to control behavior? 
punishment is one of the most effective methods for suppressing behavior, and so a society that's willing to use punishment as its prime means of control, the government would indeed be able to suppress the undesired behaviors. But the second relationship regarding the painful event, that is the pain-aggression relationship, tells us that there will also be this side effect, that aggression, anger, hostility will be pervasive in the society, not only toward the government, but should permeate all human relationships. We are stuck with a lot of punitive control because we are unwilling to turn to other methods which are much more effective and better for everyone, whereas if we arranged an environment in which people naturally behave well, then uh, we wouldn't, wouldn't give them credit, we'd give credit to the environment. You're still very much interested in the utopian ideas? Yes, I think utopian design is, is quite interesting. It, it's unfair in a way to solve problems that way by dealing only with a small group when we've got to deal with millions, uh, avoiding border problems by isolating the community when we've got to deal with border problems, of course. But the one thing that an experimental community does emphasize is the question, will it work? Is it going to be here tomorrow or next year or a hundred years from now? important to point up the fact that a culture is an experiment that may work and it may not and we have to start asking that question about our own way of life are we going to is our way of, we're not going to be here 100 years from now we'll be dead but is our way of life going to be here 100 years from now and why should we care that's the issue i think today young people are asking why why should i care whether the world of the uh, 100 years from now is mainly chinese or mainly russian or mainly american uh, and I think the only honest answer is that there is no good reason. But if your culture hasn't convinced you there is, there's so much the worse for your culture. If I can have a couple of you share with me some of the problems and or some of the goals you might have coming into the seminar, this would help me uh, think of ways to try to make what we're going to do together relevant to, to your real world problems. Would somebody be willing to share a problem? I found my name, part of my name problem is being happy and content with what I have rather than always looking for something better. We started working on achievement motivation about 24 years ago, the concern to do something better. Now that has to be distinguished from uh, what we later studied, uh, the need for power or the concern to have impact on other people, to be considered big, strong, important, powerful, influential, and so on. Many people mix up these two motives. Very often they confuse achievement motivation with power motivation and they think what I'm talking about is just to be more successful. And we point out there are all kinds of success, you know, there's success in the power sense, there's success in terms of doing things well, there's success in being loved by a lot of people. So, so a lot of the training has to do with making them able to discriminate one motive from another so they can focus on improving their own achievement motivation, their own achievement thinking. We use a ring toss game, for example, to see whether people stand at a moderate distance from the peg the way people with high achievement motivation generally do because that's the place where they can maximize their satisfaction. If they stand too close, They'll get the, the ringer on, but they don't get any sense of accomplishment. If they stand too far away, they won't get a ringer on, <laughs> so they won't get any sense of accomplishment either one. But right in the middle, they're most apt to make an achievement game out of it. 
one of the exercises they also do is to have them play again for money. But this time it'll cost you five cents to get into the game. Uh, if you choose to play, then you have to make three out of four to get any money back. If you enter the game, you stand at one foot, you'll get your five cents back. Two, three, you'll still get your five cents back. You stand at four feet and make three out of four, you'll get six cents back. It's a lot, it's a lot. Uh, okay. All right, okay. Okay, did the money make a difference to you? I guess it was a money factor, obviously, because I said it was. It influenced me. I just didn't want to do one, two, or three because I wouldn't gain anything, but I knew if I stood at nine and a half again, I wouldn't get any. So I went to an area where I thought I'd make money, and I made a whole penny. <laughs> did you feel rewarded by making that penny? Yeah, I did. Winning that penny obviously doesn't have anything to do with the way you look at money. You know, it has to do with the way you look at rewards. To pick a and rewards are what continue the cycle of you know of motivated activity. The absence or presence of rewards has something to do. There is an extrinsic you know element to this whole thing, and they call it rewards. D. Fine at shun. Defin. Defin. It is. Definitive. Seven. The. S O C I. Y. So. Shati. Social T. So.